Hi everyone, welcome to the MIT Press Live, a new virtual event series brought to you by the MIT Press. My name is Nicholas DiSabatino. I'm the Global Publicity Manager here, and I'm your host today. We want to first give a big thanks to the Cambridge Science Festival for including today's program as part of its virtual uh, monthly lineup. So thank you so much to the Cambridge Science Festival. Today we're speaking with Dr. Christopher Mason the author of The Next 500 Years, Engineering Life to Reach New Worlds. The Next 500 Years argues that we have a moral duty to explore other planets and solar systems because life on Earth has an expiration date. Astronaut Scott Kelly writes in his winning endorsement, Christopher Mason is a pioneer in aerospace medicine and genetics. In this book, he creates an intricate molecular level understanding of what happens to astronauts' bodies in space including my own. <laughs> he brings his knowledge, passion, and rich mission insights to create an inspiring vision of the next 500 years of space flight and human exploration. Great to see you, Chris. How are you doing today? Great. Good to see you as well. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Um, could you introduce yourself to us in a little bit, in a sentence or two? Definitely. Uh, so Chris Mason, a professor of genetics and also physiology at Wild Corona Medicine, and I've been researching a lot of, uh, as you'll hear today, you know, uh, what happens to the body in space and thinking about ways to prepare for even longer missions. And uh, this is kind of a focus, not just for my career, but I'm, I'm hoping it'll happen for a long time after my career ends. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, well, you have a wonderful visual presentation to share with us today, right? Yes. Yeah, happy to do. So I've got about a talk. It's maybe about uh, 40 to 45 minutes, and then would love to hang out and have some Q&A and discussion with people. I think it'll spark out some ideas. And we encourage, as always, thoughts, um, uh, new ideas, uh, critiques, and uh, some feedback from people. Well, that sounds great. Yeah, so um, Dr. Mason is going to share his screen with us right now for a visual presentation. And then we'll have time for about 15 or 10 minutes for audience Q&A. So take it away, Dr. Mason. Great. Uh, so again, thank you so much to the Cambridge Science Festival. Thank you to all of you for coming today. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through kind of a, a bit of what we've done and then what we're in the process of doing and then what's coming i think far into the future and i'll start with doing this as a with first with a bit of background about where we are today so one of the first figures in the book talks about more than ever we are a spacefaring species and this will be evident by what i'll describe here in this figure and as well, other uh, plots i'll show you today is that last year we launched more objects into space than really any year any year before by a pretty well uh, large amount by more than twice as much as anything before and you can see here when we first started putting things in flight, a lot of it was the US and Russia or some UK, but it's also diversified. There's a lot more of other countries getting into the space race, uh, which I'll tell you about today. And there's also, I think as many of you have probably seen, of course, there's just recently been a little tiny uh, helicopter on Mars, Ingenuity, that was hiding in the belly of the Perseverance rover. And I also have some pictures of Perseverance. You can see here it's turning and twisting and floating and stably flying in the Martian thin atmosphere, 1% of our own atmosphere. So this idea that used to be that Mars was this really kind of, you know, far away and distant planet that was hundreds of millions of miles away is actually made it feel recently much closer. So this is a rendering from NASA that shows what are all the tools and technologies and really instruments being deployed to help explore the planet and not, not just to go there to visit, but ideally to go there to stay long term. So more than ever, this feels closer, feels more tangible. We are more than ever a spacefaring species. We're also more than ever a sequencing kind of species. We're now sequencing human genomes at a really large clip because of this plot, where you can see it used to be about $100 million or more to sequence one human genome to get all the DNA uh, basically uncoded. And so you could actually understand the A, C, G, and T of the genetic code. These days, it's actually in the ranges of, of hundreds of dollars rather than hundreds of millions of dollars. And so this has led to the uh, technology, pace of technology that is the fastest that humans have ever really experienced. And this is something that's enabled us to have genome guided medicine at our hospital at New York Presbyterian and, and at Cornell. And also led us to understand and find new genes. So for example, if you look in the human genome, how many genes do we have? We have about 10,000 more genes today than we did about 10 years ago. It's because we're using these sequencing methods to still find new genes the fundamental components of human biology and human DNA are still being discovered. Like as of this year, we're still finding them. And it's not just true for human DNA. If you look at other species, we're using these sequencing methods to find them all over the world. We can see here's a, what we found in the past uh, few decades or centuries and what's projected for these different families. 
you can see birds. We're probably not going to find them any more new birds, though, because they're kind of big and easy to spot. But in almost every other aspect of life, we have been and will continue to find new species with these different molecular uh, testing methods. And it's not just on Earth. We just published a paper a month ago that showed we can actually find some sneaky new bacteria in space that could maybe survive on Mars. And so that means that every day when I wake up, you know, I'm kind of sleepy, I go into the shower. Every day is actually not just any random day. Every day is because we have the greatest capacity to sequence DNA, the greatest amount of data that's ever existed before. Every day I wake up, there's more data than any day before. That means every day is actually the best day ever to be a geneticist. So every day I wake up is, is, is the best day in terms of its capacity for possibilities. Uh, and so I sometimes even uh, a couple of times I'd even start to, to run to lab from getting out of the subway because I'm literally that excited because it's actually, it's not just my opinion, this is true just based on the fact. So very exciting. And, and with that backdrop, I want to kind of layer that into the beginning of the book of what's happening, what we have learned and what we will learn. And kind of summarize for you today, this is kind of the Cliff Notes version of the book that you'll experience the next about 40 minutes of everything uh, that I'm hoping will happen. And I think that actually can happen. And this is a book of nonfiction. Everything I'll describe to you today are things that we know we can already do today and have proof of principle experiments done. So it requires no new science or actually technology beyond what we know today. And so to tell you what I think is gonna happen in the future, I'll start first with what happened in the past, in the past decade, how far we've come in these three key questions. And actually the 10, the sort of 10 bullet points in the 500 plan, I, I wrote as just bullet points when I started my lab in 2010 and was kind of hoping uh, that a lot of these things would happen. And a lot of them have actually really come to happen. So for example, uh, it wasn't just you know the US thinking about going to space, but China and India are racing to go there. Recently, Israel got a spacecraft onto the moon. You can see here, it actually spilled out these cute little tardigrades or water bears that kind of tumbled out into the moon. This is what they look like up close. I'll come back to these guys also later. The Chinese Chang 4 mission also sprouted cotton plants on the moon. So recently we've had plants coming out and sprouting on the moon. There's even now extensive architectural firms like this one where actually are making moon-based renderings and, and having plans built for essentially creating these structures on the moon. So if you're thinking about what could be a cool job to tell a kid today and you could tell them, do you want to be a lunar architect? That's a legit job that kids can hope for today. So this is uh, one of several firms being paid right now to make these kind of uh, drawings and these plans uh, so we, people can stably uh, and, and reliably say uh, on the Martian, on Martian or lunar surface. And so this is very exciting. It's great. Uh, but you have to keep in mind when we go to the moon, it's not without its risk, right? So we know, for example, these are some nuclear foil packs that were worn by Neil Armstrong on his way to the moon. And we know even since the early 70s that there are risks because these are essentially tracer packs of high energy particles zooming through essentially these tracer packs, which means they're also zooming through his cells and causing damage. And so we want to understand this risk and characterize it. But we want to look at this in the context of everything else that changes in the human body that's just normal slings and arrows of surviving on earth in particular if you think about what changes normally when you age your telomeres shrink as you age and these are the little bookends at the ends of chromosomes that shrink when you get older but that's not the only thing if you think about also what your dna is as it's packaged and regulated this is called the epigenome where this regulatory layer behind dna which makes rna which makes protein the epigenome itself also changes over time in particular if you think of the DNA as black here in these molecules, the sort of A, C, G, and T, the epigenome in this instance is actually these small chemical tweaks, these epigenetic modifications here that you see in red. And they can indicate when you want to change the function of some part of your DNA or turn, turn a gene on or turn a gene off, which I'll talk about shortly, or also indicate when DNA is damaged. You can see here 8-oxoguanosine is when you have broken strands essentially of your, of your G nucleotide that's broken off. And we can see this in astronauts. I'll show you this in a little bit. But this is this is essentially all the features of DNA that can tell you when you haven't changed the, the genetic code, ACGT, but just how it's regulated or how it's damaged. And so because of this, this is a, something that's normal as you just age. So for example, identical twins when they're three years old versus 50-year-old, they have more differences when they're older. So identical twins are less identical every single day that passes. And this is because of epigenetic drift. You can see here, there's just more differences, 50 versus three years old. But there's also other things that happen to them. They just accumulate mutations. This is something that's called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential or CHIP. And what this is, is the accretion and sort of addition of mutations that we all just get. And we all get mutated every day. All of you are a little bit more mutated today than you were yesterday, but, uh, but you are generally OK. Uh, but as you get older and older, eventually you start to see these mutations show up in your blood that are coming from your bone marrow, this hematopoiesis, where your blood is made. 
And this has been actually shown already to predict potentially years in advance, even a decade ahead of when you might get cancer. So there's all these, this new understanding in the past 10 years of how do we understand genetic and epigenetic risk and drift, but what about in space? How does this kind of translate to what we think about for astronauts? And so one of the things I'd hoped to do when I started the lab was to start to do uh, missions uh, to start to understand this risk for astronauts. And indeed, we had a unique chance in 2014, NASA announced a mission to have uh, Scott Kelly, who was an identical twin, Mark Kelly, who's now Senator Kelly, uh, to say we're going to put them up and hit Scott up in space and have control and we, we encourage solicitations uh, for ideas and we were one of the 10 teams that were selected and led the genetics uh, and the genomics aspects of this mission and you know it really unique opportunity because we of course you know so it's like well you're going to need a patch for this so we got this really great patch that showed epigenetics here in the middle and we also uh, coordinated across all the teams and with NASA and launched out into space in 2015 to go up for a year. And for this mission, we wanted to study really almost every aspect of biology that we could. And this included, you can see here, Scott Kelly in zero gravity um, space station. He also did a multivalent flu vaccine. You can see him here doing the injection, uh, kind of giving us a little bit of a, uh, makes a little pinch, a little bit of an ouch there, uh, but keeping his good spirits up. And we wanted to see what happened to his T cells. What happens to his body? How does it react in, in microgravity when we think about a really complex reaction of the immune system of T cells and B cells responding because he gave the thumbs up, he did. And so we wanted to take, we took frozen blood samples, but we also wanted fresh blood samples. And so one of the protocols we use is demonstrated here by astronaut Kochi Wakata, which here you can see when you try and actually capture blood in space in zero gravity, the butterfly needle still works fine, but the tube floats around a little bit and what but works just fine because you have negative pressure in the tube and you have positive pressure in your body pushing out so that still works fine, but you can see here, it's a little bit different, a little bit harder, but working with a lot of the NASA engineers and logistics, we actually got fresh blood samples that were collected. You can see here in flight and not just one, but sometimes uh, several, uh, half a dozen of them or so. And these samples would be basically plopped into a Soyuz capsule, uh, launched through the atmosphere. Retro thrusters would fire when they'd get back to Kazakhstan. This sample would be picked up and repatriated by helicopter and then brought back to Houston only 36 hours prior to being in orbit. So we actually had both for, uh, fresh blood samples for a variety of tests, as well as some frozen samples to test over the course of a long mission. And so after he was uh, in space for one year, Scott Kelly undocked from the space station. You can see him here undocking, and this essentially is uh, the Russian capsule, the Soyuz. Uh, this is Russian telemetry data. It doesn't just say bring back vodka, although that's what some people see. You can see the earth down below as it's passing as the Soyuz capsule is making its way towards the earth. And then you can see the chute deployed, no problem. And again, uh, landed in Kazakhstan here when we were still using the Soyuz capsule and uh, being helped up by the Russian cosmonauts and staff there. And Scott Kelly here gave us a really great uh, thumbs up. But one of the intriguing things was when he, when he got back that there were some really uh, sharp changes. So for example, his skin really had this unique reaction where anything it touched, it felt like it was on fire and he had rashes and discoloration anywhere they had contact. And you know he had flu-like symptoms, wanted to go to the emergency room, his ankles, swelled up to the size of basketballs. And, you know, it had this really strange reaction where even just the weight of clothing on his skin was too heavy and really uh, didn't even want to have that weight on his skin. And the big question we had is why? You know, what had happened uh, inside of his body that made this occur? You know, and some things we do know, for example, when you go to space, a lot of the fluid in your body goes up. You get about two liters of fluid that moves up in your upper body instead of your lower body. And you get a little bit taller. You kind of get a bit stretched out. You get two inches taller. But we didn't have a real molecular understanding of this. We really want to do a fine grain, really rich, detailed look at everything that happens inside the body, what we call a multi-omics analysis of human spaceflight. And so to do this, we wanted to look at everything from down to the DNA level, to how DNA is packaged in chromatin, to how chromosomes look and cells and structures and tissues, and do everything we possibly could. So we did looks at genetic variation, epigenetic changes, RNA and protein changes, chromatin, antibodies, and immune cell changes, telomeres, cytokines, metabolomics, microbiome, cognition, and vasculature all over the course of every few weeks for two and a half years to get a good rendering of what happened inside of his body, what happened when he landed, can we use this as a guide for any future missions, how much of the risk that he experienced could help us understand the risk for Mars, and put this together into one big compendium. And so what we published about 18 months ago was the first snapshot of this data where we looked across all these ohms, which includes the microbiome or all the microbes in your body, the proteome, the proteins or transcriptome, which are the RNA molecules, metabolome, which is all the small molecules in your, in your body, in your bloodstream, and, look, and compare this across all these different modalities and analytes and see, well, do things go up or down in unison? And in particular, what things seem to be coincident and changing together? And one of the things that was really striking is you can see here, we saw telomeres 
we got longer when he went into space, which is kind of the opposite of what we expected. And so we worked with Susan Bailey's lab on this and actually did validated between both of our labs and thought, well, maybe this is just something weird about Scott. So we did a follow-up study last year then confirmed that two other astronauts that run only six month missions confirmed this. We could see longer telomeres here, you can see pop up. We also saw more chromosomal inversions and some persistent DNA damage, which I'll come back to later. But we could see it did show up there. And we thought, you know, again, like kind of what's happening? There's really stress on the body, there's radiation. Where else does this occur? Well, uh, when you climb Mount Everest, you get more radiation and you actually get under a lot of stress and hypoxia. So we worked with Willie Benegas and Matt Moniz, who actually had twins that stayed at sea level and then basically replicated this on uh, Mount Everest. And here too, we observed the same thing. The twins on mountain on the mountain of Everest actually got longer telomeres as those at sea level, and then did an additional 11 other astronauts to confirm it again. And so here we can actually see that this is a kind of a consistent feature of space flight and they have more uh, inversions, which are kind of these other uh, segments of DNA damage. And so it was interesting. This is actually, you know, a thing about the radiation, the stress in the body. And the hypoxia came up again because we thought about what we saw in, in Scott Kelly, and we could see here, these are different colors that show genes that go up or down or gene expression. So does something get activated or turned off? And we could see your genes for the immune system, DNA repair, and even sometimes hypercapnia, which is when you have too much carbon dioxide. And I thought, you know, this is strange, but it wasn't without precedent. Scott complained about it in his book that when the CO2 scrubbers would break, sometimes he would get headaches. So of course we asked NASA and said, well, does this comport with what you saw for the space station metrics? Do you see higher or lower oxygen or carbon dioxide? And they said, oh, I fluctuated, but not really. So we checked the data. We published this in the paper a year and a half ago. But then we talked with other astronauts to get a sense of well, why else could this be happening? And we actually found out that if you think about what happens to air in space, here best exemplified by astronaut Jack Fisher, air does not move the same way it does on Earth. And here in particular, if you blow a, blow a bubble in space, it can just kind of stay in front of your face and lead to this kind of mini clouds of CO2 that might indicate to some of the, and drive the hypoxia we see in the blood. So it's kind of intriguing feature of spaceflight. So that was one thing we thought about that was probably explained to the degree by that. But the other thing we looked at is what happened to his ankles when he got back to, back to Earth after a year. And the immune system we saw rapidly responded to gravity with both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory markers. All these different signatures here, you can see sometimes changing thousands or hundreds of percent higher just on the day and two or after he landed which led to this really striking change. In some cases, the most significant changes we've seen from any astronaut, and some of them even overlap with signatures of COVID. For example, IL-6 we'll see upregulated in COVID patients in the past year at the hospital. And so really, almost like landing uh, back on Earth after being in space after a year, leads to these really sharp spikes in his blood work. But again, the, the good news is they, they go back down. It was only a few days of really uh, severe pain and suffering, but was quick to go away. Whereas COVID patients, of course, it can last for weeks or even months. But also, if you look at these networks, it's distinct from just an infection because, for example, here, the way they all link to each other, these are different uh, prone inflammatory markers. They mostly link towards muscle regeneration and muscle adaptation. So we're able to show here that to a large degree, uh, you know, this is what's happening inside of his body and what led to probably that really stress in that first few days coming back to Earth. So the other thing we looked at, as I alluded to before, is the epigenetic age and to get older or younger. And actually for both the twins, you can see Mark here in green, Scott in blue, they're about the same. There were some fluctuations and red is their estimated chronological age. They're both a little bit estimated to be older than they should be, but it didn't seem to be affected by space flight. So that seemed to be a bit of good news. And then we also looked at this, the clonal hematopoiesis I mentioned, or CHIP, which actually gets a little bit better in space. So if you see, this is the mutations you see in the blood or the allele frequency, it went down, but actually stayed down. It actually got better in space. And so by some metrics, you could say Scott Kelly got younger and at least a little bit taller in space. But we know that actually the taller component went away as soon as he landed back on Earth. And the younger part was on some metrics, but we do know that some of the mutations did come back. And so we can see that this sort of change in the mutations in his blood is something we're going to keep an eye on for the future, probably for not just him, but for all the other astronauts uh, at, at NASA and also at SpaceX, I'll tell you about, but also you know, this is much like a mole on your back. So if you have a mole, it's not a question of, is it necessarily bad just by itself, but does it have, is it getting bigger? Is it changing? Is it getting discolored? That's what you really want to do uh, when you're thinking about any long-term risk for say cancer or cardiovascular disease. But overall we say uh, in this paper and subsequent work is that it's good news. There's no red flags on the way to going to Mars. We think that actually uh, the human body could make it there. Uh, it does have a higher risk of course, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. But we think overall, generally good news, most of these omics measures did recover. Okay, so next steps. So that's kind of a lot of what we saw from that mission. But if then let's start to looking ahead. What else will we need to have in place to start to get into phase two, where we begin to in you know, integrate new elements into mammalian genomes and understand them, we'll have more astronaut studies, and eventually hopefully get boots on Mars. 
So one of the first things that we're doing and have been doing for the past few years is, of course, we need more samples. We need to better understand what happens to the body, not just for a few people, but for uh, hundreds. Now, keep in mind, there's a maximum of 583 people that have ever been to space. Like that is basically it. So we're not just looking at NASA and other government agencies. We're also collaborating with civilian and commercial partners, including SpaceX. There's a mission in September. We'll be replicating the majority of these metrics I just showed you for these, uh, what are called the commercial astronauts. And we're also partnering with NASA on their additional astronaut programs that are going out for varying duration missions. So that's, you know, you can see what one of the selected proposals here. And the other thing we're thinking about is trying to make it so it's more real time. Instead of bringing all the samples back and having to wait months or even years to finalize everything, you know, could we make it so much, much faster? Like, could we just, you know, sequence DNA on the space station or even right on Mars itself? Are there ways that we could do that? There actually are. And one of these is a mission that we started in 2016 called the B-Seq mission or biomolecular sequencer where we wanted to basically get a small DNA sequencer up in space and see if it could work. Now, as we were planning this, of course, NASA loves patches. So like, okay, we should probably get a patch together. Voila, we got a patch. And you can see here's the nanopore sequencer heading into space. As we started planning out the mission, right around that time, the CRS-7 exploded on its way to the space station. So fortunately, nobody was on that spacecraft, but actually we lost obviously a lot of supplies and essential components for future experiments and missions. And this was kind of a dark day, but then actually got this really nice touching letter from NASA that was saying, Dr. Mason, you know, as Scott Kelly tweeted, space is hard, you know, we're all devastated, but we're going to get more supplies and hang in there. A very touching, you know, uh, reach out from NASA to say, keep up the faith. And so in the meantime, we thought, well, we know we have other ways we could do testing essentially of the nanopore sequencer. So this is a parabolic flight simulator, or it's the empty out of 747, you get, you know, 12 to 20 seconds of zero gravity. And we thought, well, let's try this. In the meantime, Andy Feinberg, who's one of the twins investigators, said, hey, I'm, I'm going up there. Actually, anyone have any ideas for experiments? And I said, well, yeah, we should actually see if this nanopore sequencer will work. I'll send it over to you. And then Andy got ready to start doing the pipetting. You can see here, if any of you have ever been in the lab, you know that normally your pipette tip should stay in place. But you can see here they definitely did not. And so a lot of the tips and tubes and supplies, when you got these little bursts of uh, zero gravity, you can see just kind of float around uh, and he's still trying to stay focused, doing the transfers, keeping his mind on task and eventually you get to the bottom of the parabolic flight and then everything crashes to the ground. He maintained his focus, loaded this little mini sequencer, the minion sequencer, and we showed that zero gravity sequencing passed its first test. And we were very lucky that one of the next, next astronauts to go up there was Dr. Kate Rubens, who's a trained virologist. And so we worked through actually the protocols for getting her ready for sequencing in space. And she actually successfully made her way back to the space station, no problem. And we showed in 2016 for the first time that you could sequence in space. This is now standard flight hardware. And what we're thinking about now is we know that it works in space, but can we think about other places to use it? So in particular, we've been using it in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory clean room, and also thinking about could this make its way towards Mars uh, and think about other ways, other things we could sequence in this room. So this is actually where the spacecraft get built. For example, the Perseverance rover that's on Mars right now was built here. You can see here the rendering as it was getting put together. And if you think about this, though, what's exciting is, you know, the engineers are people too, of course, right? So they'll get excited about a robot that they're sending to Mars. They might take a selfie with the robot that they're sending to another planet. I think I would do the same thing. But if you think about what's here is this is people that, you know, these are not hermetically sealed suits. This You might get a little bit of trace DNA. And one of the components of NASA's planetary protection program is to make sure that very little DNA or biomolecules of any kind goes either from our planet to another or from another planet to us. It's kind of either forward or reverse contamination, it's called. And you know, you think about this, but DNA is everywhere. It's going to be almost impossible, even with the most rigorous cleaning protocols, which JPL uses, to ensure that not a single piece of DNA made it there, or uh, that, because it's almost impossible to get rid of them all. So if you think ahead a little bit, what we do know that's going to happen is eventually the Perseverance rover will actually collect these samples. You can see here, it'll be kind of scanning around for different areas around Mars. You can see, for example, here's one canyon. It might be looking out to the horizon. This is actually a beautiful picture uh, from the surface of Mars. It actually looks almost Earth-like. Uh, eventually, though, the rover will actually look towards the ground and try and find some places to dig into the regolith, which looks like this, and collect some samples and package them up to eventually be picked up. It'll look back longingly at Earth. This is what it'll look like at nighttime from the rover as it's looking for Earth. It's what it looked like in 2014, for example. But eventually, there's a plan for the year 2032 to have a Mars sample return mission. Is that some of these packaged bits of soil will be picked up and then brought back to Earth for characterization. Now they'll be characterized you know, geochemically, they'll be looked at physically. We'll also, if there's anything present that's a biomolecule, try and sequence it. And one of the first things we'll do is, is to try to, to separate anything that we find that might be in those samples and compare it to anything that we found that was actually in the clean room during the construction of this rover. 
So in particular, we'll compare, actually, we need this, you know, a measurement of everything that's ever been sequenced or characterized on Earth in its history, and then compare that to anything that we found, we found in the sample when it comes back. It's basically planetary genomics, like this really large scale thinking about planetary protection with genome or modern genomic methods. And so we've recently published a, a means by which to do this, which is a metagenomics framework to characterize anything that can survive on the way towards Mars or back, and also everything that we found in that clean room. And so it's a really rapid characterization of everything that's there. It's basically this large scale global map of everything that's ever been sequenced on Earth. And so just to give you a quick preview of this, what this looks like is if you go actually um, to, uh, you can go to Metagraph, which is actually this website that has an index of everything that's ever come out that's been sequenced, you can see here, and you can then search for it. So say you have this sequence and you'd like to say, I wanna know, has this sequence been observed anywhere on Earth before? We've done this based on any place we've selected samples and sequenced them, and then where they occur in different places they've been collected. But we can look in all different databases uh, and then also visualize them. We can say, give them in a certain sequence and uh, can I actually play with this and figure out what it's the most similar to based on this hashing table. And so it is this extraordinary time where we now have literally a global index of everything that's ever come from Earth, that as soon as we get these samples back in the year 2032, we'll be able to actually quickly compare them. So it's kind of coming up soon or relatively soon uh, for some of the missions occurring. And so that's been exciting for the past decade and these next coming uh, years and even decade. But we want to eventually move from just measuring DNA to actually actively defending against some of these changes. So in particular, we want to think about putting internal armor into cells. And I put this into phase three because I think we still have another good 20 years of really basic understanding of the human genome and other genomes before we could do this really well. I think we'll have to begin only then long-term human trials on potential genome or epigenome engineering, which I'll show you shortly, and try to think about monitoring and fixing any off-target effects and you know, accidents that the technology is not perfect, but I'll, I'll show you some examples shortly. And so the reason we want to do this is because if you think about you know, what's happened to astronauts that we published just last year is that in the year, and I mentioned before this 8-oxyguanosine, this like indicator of damaged and broken DNA, you can see in flight day 15 or other flight days, you see more and more of this as soon as they get into the space. And when they return, it comes back down quickly. But in multiple ways that you can measure this, it's definitely a lot more damaged DNA coming out of their body because they're being irradiated about five chest x-rays a day. And we know that that's, you know, when they're in low Earth orbit. So if you look at Scott Kelly, this is the amount of radiation he saw here in light blue over the course of a year-long mission. If you look at other kinds of exposures to the body, uh, if you think about a three-year Mars mission, it would be the hardest trip yet in terms of getting there and back. And so it begs the question, we, and we think it's actually, it definitely can make the trip there, but could we think about other ways to protect astronauts? So for example, could we genetically protect astronauts? Could we use any of these modern genetic methods to do such a thing? And, but that space is, raises big ethical questions, you know, can we, but then should we do such a thing uh, is really a big, uh, big ethical and sort of technical challenge. And, you know, we know the way to not do this, for example, is to actually, you know, CRISPR babies and then have the embryos be born and release them onto the world. So we do it kind of the opposite way. We have discussions like this and get out to the to public and talk to people and say, you know, how, how would this work if we built a genome from scratch? What are the ethical and philosophical and technical rules? I'm one of the steering committee members of the Genome Project Right Consortium. We're trying to build genomes from scratch, including human genomes, but thinking about this long in advance from when we're actually doing it. And so again, this seems a little bit, you know, again, it almost is sci-fi, but it's not really because we're doing it today. And I'll again, show you more examples as to how, but it's also worth noting that in a therapeutic capacity, this is something that's already happening. So there are engineered genomes and engineered clinical trials for a variety of therapies already happening. This is a picture of me visiting one of our sites in Hangzhou, where they're actually modifying cells and then infusing them back into patients. This is called CAR-T therapies or chimeric antigen receptor uh, therapies, where you basically put in a modified gene for this CAR into T cells. You make it so they express these cells, you grow them up, infuse them back into the patient and have these engineered cells essentially then target, exquisitely target the cancer cells to hopefully kill them. So basically you have a continuous cycle of modifying and engineering cells for therapy. And this isn't just one or two trials here and there. There's actually now a hundred, let's go back, there's hundreds of clinical trials for CAR-T and of the number of trials that are actually using modified genomes or modifying cells, there's now dozens and dozens of them around the world where we're seeing these CRISPR-based methods or other, these are other ways you can modify genomes all being currently deployed in the clinic. And so this is something that's not abstract, it's not a possibility, it is an ongoing clinical enterprise. And it starts where it usually does in medicine for the patients that have the most severe diseases, have the most you know, highest likelihood of not being able to recover, and we're bringing the, the best to bear for technology to try and save their life. 
And so this means that if this is already happening, you know, could we think about other things that we could tweak or modify or add to cells, which I talk about in the book. So for example, we know there's a gene called TP53, which is often called the guardian of the genome. And for elephants, they have 20 copies of the gene, but you can see almost every other species has two or maybe four copies of this gene. And elephants have a lower risk of cancer. So this has been shown by a paper in 2016 that this may be a way you can actually decrease the risk of cancer. You could have them put into human cells. Or what about tardigrades? These cute little water bears, could we take a lesson from them? Could that decrease damage that happens to cells? We know from a paper from Hashimoto in 2016, the answer is yes. They got a 40% reduction in DNA damage. So we took some lessons from this paper and then thought if we could put this gene stably into human cells, uh, basically put this so it's constitutively active and constantly uh, present. And here you can see we took cells. This is the, the, the center of the cells in blue. And here's where we see some of the DCEP protein localizing. And we see where it's localizing to where we see uh, breaks of DNA when the radiation's on top and not on the bottom. And so we can actually see that this DCEP protein, an, an alien protein basically taken from tardigrades and put into human cells, can lead to an 80% reduction in the damage of adoxyguanosine. You can see at one gray or two gray, the amount of radiation. When you get to lots of radiation, it no longer can tolerate it, but it does give you this ability to use CRISPR and engineering methods of cells to enable you to survive actually uh, greater amounts of radiation. And that's just using genetic methods and sort of modifying the canvas of life. But there are epigenetic ways you can also modify the canvas of life. So instead of adding genes or editing genes or taking them away, you can actually just change whether something is on or whether it's off. And so there is a range of methods that have been published recently that include either adding or taking away methylation, those little methyl marks I showed you in red in the beginning, or doing other sort of small modifications to networks. And again, this seems abstract, but it's been shown in mice and shown in clinical uh, studies. It's also now being deployed by a program called from DARPA called the PREPARE program, the Preemptive Expression of Protective Alleles. The idea being, what if you could activate genes for DNA repair before a soldier goes into an area with high radiation or a biological threat? So basically preparing people for high-risk environments to by turning genes on when you need them and then turning them back off later. And so this you know, is an extraordinary uh, you know, application that really sets the stage, I think, for what will happen in the 2050s and 2060s. And this is when we get into phase four. There's actually a picture of what should be a space station around Mars at that time called Mars Base Camp, which sounds like kind of like a fun summer camp, but it's actually around Mars. And by that time, I'm hoping that we have not just perfected CRISPR and epigenetic CRISPRing methods, but also we've begun to think about ways to remove uh, what I call molecular ineptitude. Because if you're far away from Earth or even farther away from the sun, you're going to have limited resources, limited vitamins, limited food. So why not think about what else is in our genome that we could kind of bring back? So for example, vitamin C autosynthesis was lost among some mammals and most primates. But you can see here in bold, all these bold animals, they can still make their own vitamin C. They won't get scurvy. Their gene is still functional. Whereas we have this gene, it's just in a broken form in our DNA. Could we bring it back? The answer is actually very much yes, but you know, we don't know what it would do to other genes in our genome, but it's something to think about that we could bring back. And then if you think also about making our own food, so you know you have to have in your diet at least nine of these essential amino acids. You can make 11 out of the 20 amino acids you need, but not, not uh, there's nine that you can't make. So why is that? Why do we have this molecular ineptitude? Couldn't we fix that? We already know that we could. So even just taking genes from, from yeast and also methanobrevibacter, we know enough of the biosynthesis pathways to actually reconstruct and make all of the, our own essential amino acids just by borrowing essentially their evolutionary adaptations and, and pathways and putting them in human cells. So this is something we're also beginning to do in our lab, also with Harris Wang at Columbia, is to build out cells that could actually are called prototrophic cells that can make all of their own vitamins and amino acids, which you'd need if you're very far from resources or if you're on the planet. And so this is kind of, you know, again, used to be, you know, decades ago, we weren't even sure if we could do this, but now we know very explicitly exactly which enzymes we need to make just a few additions to make us completely self-reliant. And then the other thing to repair, you know, disease genes is the final way you could remove molecular ineptitude is figure out some way to make it so you don't die of something that's preventable. So for example, this has been done for genes for um, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or which can give you heart attacks. This has been shown that you can actually modify embryos from scratch and actually fix them before it's too late. Uh, other in, in, uh, interesting innovations I talk about in the book is that there's been two mom and two dad children where you don't need, uh, you, you can have all same sex, uh, potentially progeny. So you just a little bit of genome editing, you can have two mothers uh, take one of their uh, oocytes and actually borrow nuclei from the other mother and essentially create these uh, gametes from same sex uh, parents. This has been already shown in mice. You can have three parent children. That's been shown in, in, um, in the UK and also in the US where you have a mitochondrial donor. So you have a father, mother, and then a third mother, basically, or a third parent, uh, which is donating mitochondria to avoid disease there. 
And so this is really fundamentally changed, I think, how people think about children or the capacity for one cell to become any possible cell. And then once that happens, you can think about, well, what if you actually you know, have any other problems? Like what if you have uh, uterine cancer and you couldn't carry to term? Here too, there's been other uh, innovations that have made it so you could have exo wombs or an ability to actually grow outside the body. So it's been shown actually, you can see here, uh, a sheep that was born or eventually born after it was in an exo womb. So it actually uh, was living and basically created in this uh, artificial womb or an exo womb that really leads to this idea of, you know, you no longer, you can eventually have art, you can have cellular liberty, I'd like to say, is that from the very first cell that you get, you're no longer beholden to the random genetic lottery of what you inherited. You can actually, you know, have liberty in terms of where you would, how you'd have children, what you would do with your cells, how you'd even have your children develop, whether it's uh, inside or outside of a body. This again, it's looking decades ahead, but the technologies for this already exist today. But this raises, I think, some of the most critical and, and potentially, uh, you know, dangerous uh, ethical questions of, you know, can we really select the best embryos? Do we know enough today to be able to do that? This has been critiqued by many in the field over the years, myself included. Most recently, there's a startup called Orchid, which is offering to sequence two parents' genomes and help them pick the next, uh, their, their best baby using something called the polygenic risk score, which is all the genes together, what's your combined score, essentially this S, which is the weight of the effects of each one of these genes together that are known for a disease. So in concept, it's kind of simple. It's one summation where you say, okay, if you have a disease, your cases or your controls, you don't have the disease, what's your risk factor across different genes? You wanna basically just avoid the high risk polygenic risk scores and optimize for the low risk scores. And so again, in theory, it's kind of simple. You wanna avoid disease, sounds like a good idea. But there's challenges to it. So we know that if the measure is imperfect, so is the metric. And we know that the, the critique here is that the ancestry in some cases is, is really well uh, driving uh, that risk score, not the actual risk of the disease. And so this is best exemplified, for example, what's your risk for schizophrenia? It's actually more associated with ancestry than it is for schizophrenia. Down here are different ancestries. Are you black, Asian, white, Hispanic? And your risk score depends much more on that than your actual risk of schizophrenia. And so this has been appropriately critiqued by many scientists in the field. But I think this is a question of, of missing data and perfect data. So in theory, in 30 or 40 years, this might be corrected, might get improved. But I think even that's not enough. I think eventually, and I describe in, in the book a lot, is that we'd want to have a real multi-generational risk score for something like this. It's not just about for any given risk score for a disease and a for certain treatment in a given place. What is What does it do to the, your life expectancy or what's the odds of success or treatment? What does it do to your quality of life? What about proxy suffering? What if it improves your life, but it helps other people might suffer or vice versa? And also how does this change your expected age of death, your risk of developing other diseases? As pleiotropy where one gene has multiple impacts or balancing selection, heritability, what does it do to the economic burden of having a new therapy deployed? So I think all these questions, you know, I think shouldn't be done in, in, in the isolate of looking at one sample and one person, but more broadly integrated across, at least this is kind of a almost like a direct equation for genome editing, if you will, of like, well, all the things that I think we should consider when deploying some of these technologies in the future. And again, we're kind of deploying them already today. It's just, I think we're doing it in a pretty imperfect uh, capacity. So but my hope is though, but when we get towards phase five, we start to have a, a mastered a lot of these technologies, these methods, and we can be begin to think about actually settlement of other planets and genesis of entire synthetic genomes. So for example, could we send people to an alien ocean like on Europa? Or, you know, can we synthesize whole genomes from scratch? Here, indeed, we know we can. This is for bacteria, but we eventually can start to do it for larger genomes. And instead of just synthesizing a genome, why not even give yourself like a whole new organelle? Like, could you actually get, for example, uh, chloroplast? Like, let's say you wanted to have green skin so you could actually be photosynthesizing. Like, if you're hungry, you say, oh, I'm going to go lay out by the pool because I'm kind of hungry. I've got this green skin. If you were basically kind of, a, you know, a, you know, a homo greenin, or if you were essentially chlorohumin, what would that look like? And so I did some math in the book. It's kind of a fun part of the book of, well, making certain assumptions about how big your skin is and if you're laying on your stomach and how much photon capture do you get, you know, and how much, how many millijoules do you need for one day? You'd need to lay out for one hour and need about a 300 fold epidermis expansion to get all the energy you need for the day, which is like two tennis courts. Again, I think this will be on the harder end of things to do to cells in the future, but it's interesting, I think, and kind of fun to think about of the things that we could do, assuming that the cells, like cellular components would be compatible. Which again, you'd think like, well, how are you going to get a chloroplast into a human cell and have the human cells even be happy with that? You know, here too, I take some lessons from what's already happened uh, today is that there are human pig chimera embryos or, you know, essentially primates and other human cells grown in embryos that we know have already happened. And so it, these are very early days today, but in 60, 70 years, it's very likely we'd understand a lot more of the mechanisms for tolerating, you know, these different sort of chimeric or peculiar versions uh, of human cells that could have new features. 
Uh, and again, this is just done with embryos, but if you look at just other organisms on Earth, like deloid rotifers, for example, they're often called by some an evolutionary scandal because they actually have this sort of life without sex, which sounds like, you know, essentially a, a teenager's like worst possible dream or nightmare, I'd say worst nightmare. Um, but they do it because they need to eat borrowed DNA to survive. And that about eight to 10% of their genome is foreign because they actually eat it from other organisms as part of their survival mechanism. It seems like a really weird adaptation, except that you have to look almost inside ourselves as well, because actually about 8% of our genome is uh, likely came from a virus. If you look back across evolution, uh, the other is endogenous retroviruses that have in incorporated into our own DNA that make up a good chunk of our genome. So we're, even us, we're a little bit of a hybrid creature as we walk around Earth. And so when we find other creatures on Earth, I think that's where we start to really get uh, really intriguing surprises elsewhere in phase six. We would continue to work like we have been doing already and called the Extreme Microbiome Project in our lab is to try and basically find these adaptations from creatures that have survived in really harsh environments. So for example, high or low salinity, temperature, pressure, moisture, or toxicity. These are the different places we've been collecting and characterizing samples around the world. And you know, trying to figure out how did something survive in these places? And so this is using genetics as a lens to better understand evolutionary adaptations in all these different places. And we've even been looking out in the space station. We found in this case, for example, some species we published a few months ago that they had you know, new kinds of genes for DNA repair, even some molecules that could be used for sunscreen or biofilm understanding. So this really learning from these experiment files gives us a new lens of basically the lessons of billions of years of evolution that we can then characterize and potentially use to add to our own genetic toolkit, which we'll need, I think, as we get to the worlds that are farther and farther out. But even in the, in the closer world, so for example, I think by phase seven, we'd understand those experiment files well enough to begin to send genomes to Earth-like to Earth planets and have them survive. So my hope is, and we published this last year, is that eventually Mars would start to become self-reliant, is that we'd actually be able to create photoautotrophs or you know, start to basically create our own crops and our own therapies and eventually reach a closed life support system on, on Mars. And this would be you know, hopefully the beginning of what I like to say is planetary liberty, is that you no longer beholden to just one planet, you could potentially go to between Earth and Mars and maybe even to other planets. And so this is cellular liberty, the ability to have your cells be able to do anything you want or don't want them to do is the, just an expanded version of that. You can actually go to any planet that you want to go to. And so right now it's really limited to maybe a few, three or four in our solar system that are probably good candidates. But what's exciting is this is really dramatically changing the past 20 years. And I think by the time we get towards the year 2300, towards the end of that century, this is what we know today is that in 1992, we found the first exoplanet really in the past few years, we found now thousands of exoplanets and there's not just exoplanets we found. So probably by the time we get to 2300, we probably would have hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of candidate planets. But even if you just look today, like where could we possibly go? This is in the latter part of the book where I say, okay, where could we go? We know that there's already potentially habitable exoplanets that where you could probably have liquid water and you wouldn't necessarily be uh, you know, destroyed as a human being on that surface. And what's really exciting part of the book or that was a lot of fun to make was we you know, calculated the earth simulatory index based on the literature of what's the temperature of the planet, the density of the solar flux and other features of the planet. And we tried to find those planets that are blue, those things that are very close to earth or greater than nine for their similarity metric, or even purple, which are pretty close. And those that are white or gray, we don't have enough data. But even within a few parsecs, within a few light years of earth, we actually have some pretty good candidates that aren't that far away that we could get to. And if you zoom out a little bit more, if you go to say 10 or 15 parsecs, we still have all these other candidates. And, and we've just been really looking for a few years, if you think about it, it's not even that long we could even find them. And if you zoom out a little bit more, if you look either from basically the top of the galaxy on the left or the side, you can uh, basically you can see all these other blue planets that are not that far away. And if you go to where we are in the galaxy, we've just been looking here. So in terms of our galactic profile of where we've been looking for exoplanets, you can see we have all these planets found here just because that's where we've been looking recently, right? We haven't even looked that closely in all directions. And it's really just this really unique place of all these places that we know we could go today. And so what's extraordinary is 25 years ago, we had no human genome, really only no real exoplanets. We had no real basic understanding of either one of the mechanisms, but there's been these dual engines of discovery that have ratcheted up so extraordinarily fast in the past two decades that now we have thousands of each of these that we can look towards. And this is just today. So I think in the next several hundred years, it'll only get better. And so my hope is once we get towards the last phase or the ninth phase towards the year 2500, we could begin to have shipments of humans to these new worlds that we've identified and generations may live and die in the same spacecraft. And if you go towards the end of the book, essentially is this call has been thought about as called a generation ship for over a hundred years, but now we actually know where we could send people. So again, there's nowhere to send them. If you thought about this hundred years ago, there weren't even any exoplanets, but now we know. 
And so my hope in the dream is that all these technologies we've built up since the 50s for cellular engineering, transplantation, regenerative medicine, developmental biology, we detailed them all uh, here in the book. You can see here this figure. This figure is made by Matt McKay, who's the artist for the book. Uh, and you can see we laid them all out here on this one big uh, frame. And then also looking into the future, how they'll all come together to make it so we could actually have point-to-point -point biology and learn from evolutionary adaptations on one planet and then apply them to a different planet and actually have this really directed, uh, essentially accelerated evolution. Instead of having unguided random evolution, we would have directed and accelerated evolution that even can learn from multiple planets. And eventually I'm hoping send by the year 2500, a generation ship off to another planet. And so you might say, why? I think some people you know, have asked me and said, well, this is all intriguing and interesting and it's all based on science, it's not science fiction. But you know, we have other problems. We have you know, really uh, clear social and economic injustices. We have poverty, there's other diseases. We have a lot of things to worry about on earth. Why go to another planet? And some of this reason is because you know, some people say, oh, we should explore or there's lots to discover. Uh, but I actually think there's a more pressing reason. Just if you think long-term, well, what do we know about what's, where we are today is that there's about one of every four birds that are gone from North America because uh, of partly, there's a big worry that we're getting into a sixth extinction. If you look back at the history of the earth for the past 500 million years, there's already been five mass extinctions, but you can see you're anywhere from 75% to 96% of all species were destroyed and eventually they a lot recovered. But you can see here this world with and without polar ice caps for the past 500 million years. This is a quick snapshot, but this actually, if you take this and zoom out, this 500 million years in the context of the earth as a whole is really this kind of basically nice but temporary temperature canyon. We know that the earth, of course, it was really hot when it started and eventually the earth is gonna be boiled uh, up by the sun. And when I was finishing the last chapter of the book, I thought, well, uh, I was doing research and validating it. And I realized we only have about a billion years till the sun gets big enough to start to boil the oceans. And I got really sad and went downstairs and I was talking to my wife and she said, you seem so upset. I said, well, I just thought we had more time because I thought we always had about 5 billion years, but we really only have about a billion years and that's all that we've got left. And I, I find this disquieting because I think that humans are worth preserving. All life, as we know, is worth preserving. I think really anything in any food chain and ecosystem is, is, is life is this history of adaptation in these environments. And when you're a kid, you probably remember the food chain, right? Where it's like, there's three kinds of organisms. There's the producers, the consumers, and the decomposers. And in thinking about this, and, and really my pitch for the book is what is our, our duty or sort of our, 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 something that only we have is we're basically a fourth kind of species which represents guardians. Like only we are aware of the fact that all of this could go away. We're the only ones that are extinction aware and only we can actually prevent it. Of course, we have sometimes caused extinctions or might be exacerbating it, but we're the only ones that can actually preserve life because we, we're the only ones that understand its frailty. And so this has been best exemplified by work recently been working with uh, the Revive and Restore project where you can actually take cells that were in storage for 32 years and clone them, gestate them and, and have them be born. These black-footed ferrets were basically reviving species that are endangered or even restoring those that have been lost like the woolly mammoth. And this, I think, is a great exemplification of our duty to all life, both present and future life, as well as those in the past we could potentially de-extinctify. Because, again, because we're the only ones that have this awareness, we're the only ones that can act on it and really to preserve life, not just in this solar system, but eventually to other ones. And so I think this is actually, we've also long never really had a species-wide duty, but I propose that this is it because uh, there's no one else that can do it. There's, you know, I mean, maybe there's other aliens in the universe that are out there, but we just haven't found them. As far as we know, life is extremely rare in the universe, and this is it, and we're the only ones that can actually protect it. And so if you go out you know, further and further in the future, you might say, well, eventually we go to one sun and the next sun, and what happens if you go onward and onward at infinitum? Do we keep surviving and eventually prevent the implosion or heat death or rip of the big universe, or do we allow the universe to self-destruct in the hope that life will begin again? And here too, I think we'd maintain the same deontogenic duty or really our, our, necess our necessary duty based on our genetics is that we are the only guardians for life. And maybe by then it won't just be us, maybe some machine-based intelligence might be the guardians of life or some other kind of matter. I'm matter agnostic towards cognition. It could be anybody, but I think if, in any of those cases we would wanna survive or that uh, guardians would wanna survive to maintain the complexity of life as long as possible. I think indeed this is our duty and, and this is kind of the roadmap of how to make it possible. So, Thank you so much for your time. I want to thank all the Twins PIs who made a lot of the work possible for that mission, as well as uh, other missions. I want to thank the lab, as, as, as basically Scott and Mark Kelly. This is their official NASA poster. Again, the lab here made this work possible. Uh, this is us here, and also a more recent picture where everyone has been vaccinated. And thanks, of course, to funding from NASA, World Quantum NIH, and also the NCI. 
And uh, thank you to all the friends, colleagues, collaborators, astronauts, and many people who made this work possible. Thank you so much for your time, and I am happy to hang on and uh, answer some questions. That was amazing, Dr. Mason. Thank you so much. Um, it was wonderful to have the visual component and to see the videos as well. Thank you so much. Great job. Um, Thanks. If you look in the chat, we've provided some instructions on how you can submit uh, questions. Um, I have a couple ready to go here that I'm going to ask you right now. Um, one of the first ones I have is, of everything you discuss in your book, what do you see as one of the thorniest ethical issues we must consider if we are to move ahead with these plans to live on other planets? Yeah, one of the biggest questions, I think the thing that comes up a lot is, you know, how well can we model biology? You know, think about e editing, modifying genes. The, the, the reason I put a lot of the heavy editing 20 or 30 years from now is because I think we still have to have better understanding of fundamental mechanisms of, of cellular and genetic regulation, just, you know, in our own bodies, let alone others. So I think just, just knowledge is one of the, is the biggest challenges, but I think it's coming at a super exponential pace. So I think we're getting more knowledge literally every day and proof of principle experiments have already been done. So I think it's um, just continuing those experiments and more of the basic science understanding, but eventually it's like any medicine. We do a lot of medicines. We try them. We do clinical trials. We see what works and figure out what's safe. And there's probably never going to be any therapy or treatment that's zero risk, but there's going to be enough that are safe enough that we could deploy for keeping people uh, alive on other planets. That's great. Thank you. Um, Mary asks, have you considered hibernation genes like bears have? Um, she says, I have friends who have asked me to help edit them so they can sleep all winter and wake up thinner and rested. Would this be good for astronauts? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a great question. So I talk a bit about torpor and hibernation in the book. It is one thing that I explore is that we know some of the, again, the molecular mechanisms that enable this for bears. And a lot of them are actually analogous or, or quite orthologous. The genes themselves, we have some of them in humans. So could we tweak them? And I think people would love to wake up thinner and rested and maybe more <laughs> athletic too, although athletic might be hard to do. But um, we, we do we have a lot more studies that, that, are, that are fleshing this out for other mammals that can do it. And it's a really extraordinary feat what, what bears do. It, they basically, their uh, blood, I describe it in the book that it becomes like barbecue sauce and they get really gets like sludgy <laughs> and they still survive. And they don't, have, they don't have heart attacks, right? But you'd think that sounds like, I, although I do love barbecue sauce, I wouldn't mind that if my blood was barbecue sauce, but it sounds like a, a, a way to get a heart attack. But they survive well, basically control their uh, metabolism regulation to not get diabetes either. So it's really uh, an extraordinary uh, feat um, that they do. And I think we can take lessons from them, but we just haven't seen them deployed yet clinically, I think for humans, but definitely. That's great, thank you. Um, next question is, uh, don't you think a billion years is a gigantic amount of time given almost all of the progress we have made that made we made was done in the last a thousand years? Uh, yeah, a billion, I guess to me, it seems short. I, I think in the, in the lens of a billion years, all moral questions become exquisitely clear. It is a long time though, and but but it is, you know, I guess I would feel much less anxious about it if we were already, you know, on on Mars and going, people were going back and forth and we had the sense that we were on two planets and thinking ahead. I, I mean, I proposed this in 500 years because this assumes that we don't get hit by another asteroid or there's another large scale pandemic like COVID-19, obviously has been bad, but it could have been worse and there are gonna likely be other pathogens that emerge. So I, I think it is a very long time, but the, in the history of life on earth, most things haven't made it more than, you know, uh, ten singles or tens of millions of years, maybe hundreds of millions. Uh, but there's nothing that's made it, you know, maybe bacteria, I guess would count. They've made it for past a billion years, but, but they don't have the ability to get off the planet or to serve as guardians. So I think we're the only ones that have this awareness uh, that actually can help serve as shepherds for other life forms. And so I think um, uh, it is a long time if nothing goes wrong, but there's lots of ways things can go wrong. So that's why I'm in a bit of a hurry. That's great, thank you. Um, the next question is, how has exercise been incorporated into an astronaut's routine? Are there plans to build courts for playing volleyball or basketball or anything, for instance? Yeah, I, I, that's a great, great question. So there's actually, exercise is a key part of the routine. They have to work out every day. Uh, Scott described in his book, that if he missed a few days of working out for any reason, he could feel it in his bones, you know, and we can mm. actually see calcium in the urine of the astronauts. If they're not getting out their exercise, the, the bone, you know, their bones start to essentially, you know, really uh, degrade and essentially the calcium's coming out of them. So, you know, the, the bones need the reinforcement from gravity to say, okay, I need to work. I need to maintain strength uh, and calcium in my bones or else it'll, it'll basically come out of the bodies. And uh, I think they're, you know, so there's a lot of a really rigorous exercise regimen on the space station. When you get to the moon or Mars, you can imagine fantastic games of you know, football, volleyball. It'd be fabulous, actually. So I think 
who hasn't fantasized a little bit about sports, <laughs> sports in different gravity? I think that would be fabulous, definitely. That's great. Yeah, that'd be something to see. Um, so what are your thoughts about the time when humanity is able to reverse and stop aging and also dynamically update their genes to get superhuman features? Great question. So this is, uh, I've had talked with uh, David Sinclair recently published a book called Lifespan. Uh, we've, we've debated this endlessly is how long can you live? I mean, we do know that some creatures, plants, some plants and trees can live to be thousands of years long. Some tortoises can live beyond 200 years. We know it is possible to live certainly more than 126, which is the current maximum human lifespan. But we, uh, I don't know if we'll ever stop aging. I think we can delay it and even push it back. But aging, you know, it'll probably, I don't know if we'll stop aging. We'll probably just do more replacement parts. Like for example, think of your car, uh, to, be, to be mechanistic and, and derivative about it, you don't replace the whole car unless you absolutely have to, you replace parts. And so if you can get stem cell therapies working well enough, you could possibly just, you know, replace the components that go bad. Uh, I think that'll happen first. And eventually, you know, this idea of the singularity where you could upload your brain to the cloud and then transfer it to another body. These things are still pretty hypothetical. I think, you know, nothing's impossible, but I think that will certainly be several hundred years in the future, maybe even several thousand because we currently can't model it that well yet, uh, but but it is you know progressing at a really fast pace, and you know, maybe someday you could have your brain in the cloud, like the movie Her or other examples yeah. in the singularity. So it's possible, but uh, not yet, not yet. Well, speaking of Her, uh, how far are we in deploying humanoid robots for testing on other planets instead of sending humans? So yeah, and we obviously we do some of this now. We would like it. I mean, nothing quite beats a human for the ad adaptability on site, but also. We're doing some of this and, and the, you know, a lot of the work in engineering and of, of robot uh, modeling and design has also dramatically advanced in the past 20, 30 years. So I, I think there too, we're probably not, uh, not too far away. We're looking at maybe decades away where you have a, what would be arguably a pretty self-aware and or mostly self-aware entity that you could send to another planet. And so I think that would be, and this is also debates I've had with people is that, you know, it's much safer to send machines. If something goes wrong, you can just send another one and they don't, they don't, you don't have to feed them. Their bodies aren't as frail. And, uh, you know, all these other questions of can you get better propulsion systems? Uh, so I, I actually assume in the book that none of these things have happened, like the fusion drives haven't occurred, whether we have antimatter drives. I talk about them in the book, but I just for safety, I presume that, that nothing else dramatically different scientifically has occurred between now and 500 years from now, except for you know, incremental progress. But any of the things like new propulsion systems, bending of space time, all that would be awesome. Uh, I just don't know if it would happen in 500 years, but it might be in thousands of years. And so I think, um, and, and we don't, they're not mutually exclusive. We could do biological questions, propulsion, mechanical, engineering questions. I, I think if they all happen at once, it throws, it gives us multiple shots on goal and, and best chance of getting out to other planets. That's great. Um, I think we have time for about one or two more questions. Um, Dr. Mason, thanks for your great presentation. Lots of my childhood fiction dreams are coming true. However, what about climate change? Uh, do we have enough time to move to other planets? I think Elon Musk said he might not be able to go to Mars based on current tech innovation speed, while climate change may cause much bigger issues in the next 50 to 100 years. Uh, and they put sixth math, mass extinction, excuse me. Here I'm a bit of a techno optimist too. I know there's many, uh, many of my colleagues at Cornell actually have created carbon capture methods that are, uh, you know, orders of magnitude better than what we had five years ago. So I actually think this is a question of resources and allocation, not of, you know, think how terrifying it would be if we didn't know why the climate was getting warmer, right? If we had no clue. Here we actually know what it is and we even know ways to address it. So I think, I think it can be addressed. It's a, a, sadly, it's a political question, not as much of a technical question. We know exactly what to do. We could actually just plant trees and that would be enough, right? If we did that at a big enough scale. So it's amazing that it's a political uh, failure, not a technical one. But even on the technical side, there's things that are even improving much faster. So I, I think that we can address that and also use that. You know, we're, we're having a planetary model and planetary defense. And it's basically just taking, so when we go to Mars, it's the second time we'll do that. Now it's not the first, we're already doing that here to have a sense of a planetary duty and understanding and kind of a protection window. And I, I hope that that happens to other planets as well. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think the last question, question we have is um, how realistic are the scenarios in the film after earth? If you're familiar with that. Yes. So, I think after, was that the one where they, they um, was that, that's not the one where they move the planet. I think that was the moving earth. Um, actually, I don't know if I've seen after earth actually. Um, I don't, I haven't seen it either, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I confess, I, oh, that was, so I did not see that one, actually. I've seen most good sci-fi films, but I, the one with Will Smith and Jay, I did not see that, sadly, but I think 
It is. Um, it depends on what's in. The, I guess I'd have to defer to the audience because I don't. I didn't see the movie, so I can't say. <laughs> I'll say maybe. I'll say maybe. I guess I don't know. Do you have a recommendation for us, though? On that well, note, the, the thing that's really extraordinary is the Expanse, the book series or the the series um, that's on Netflix is really extraordinary. So a lot of the people in the audience have probably seen it, but if you haven't, I actually wrote the book first and then watched the series. I kind of wish I'd done the inverse because it was really uh, inspiring to think about. Well, as I was in the editing phase of the book, but I'd already written it. Uh, so it was really uh, a great series. I highly recommend it. Well, uh, Dr. Mason, we are so grateful for your time today. Um, we just want to remind everyone, um, we're putting this information in the chat. You can support your local independent bookstores or find an audio or ebook version of the, the book. Um, it's on sale now, The Next 500 Years, Engineering Life to Reach New Worlds. Uh, Dr. Christopher Mason, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe.